Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis one more time and today we're gonna talk about the amazing force of osmosis, the simple diffusion of water. And let's get started. We are in a series about acid base, fluid and electrolyte disturbance. Go to my playlist to watch all the previous videos. Let me answer the questions of the previous video. So, who is the main interstitial fluid buffer? And the answer is by carbon, carbonic acid bicarbonate system. And as you know, bicarbonate is more common in the extracellular fluid. Who is the most plentiful buffer in the intracellular fluid? And the answer is proteins they are everywhere inside the cell we haven't discussed the buffer systems yet but keep those two pieces of information in mind then let's go to this one which one accurately describe electrolyte concentration between ecf and icf and the answer here is c in the ecf there is more sodium and more chloride in the intracellular fluid compartment there is more phosphate and more potassium they start with a p in the first video of the series, we have learned that osmosis is a subtype of simple diffusion. No energy needed, no carrier needed. So what are the factors that affect diffusion, any type of diffusion? So diffusion is directly proportional to the concentration gradient. The higher the gradient, the greater the diffusion. Also directly proportional to the surface area of the membrane. The greater the surface area, the better the diffusion. Temperature, the higher the temperature, more diffusion. Okay, inversely related to the square root of M, the molecular size. The bigger the molecules, the less the diffusion. L is the length of diffusion or the thickness of the membrane. If this membrane is thick, guess what will happen? Less diffusion. There are two types of water, obligated water and free water. When you're talking about osmosis, which type are we talking about? We're talking about the obligated water. Albert Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Thank you, sir. I think many professors should learn from you. So what is osmosis? Osmosis is simple diffusion of water. Simple diffusion of water. Define simple diffusion from high concentration of water to low concentration of water across the membrane. It's like when we are defining sodium diffusion from higher concentration of sodium to lower concentration of sodium. Do the same exact thing on water from higher concentration of water to lower concentration of water across a semi-permeable membrane. Or you can do this water movement from low concentration of solute to high concentration of solute. It's the same exact thing because when there is lots of sodium in the extracellular fluid, water is gonna flow to the extracellular fluid. So from the area of low concentration of solute to the area of high concentration of solute. It needs no energy, it needs no carrier because it's a simple diffusion. What is the osmotic pressure? Some people can say it's the pressure that causes osmosis, which is true, but it's very difficult to measure that. So we define it as the pressure needed to stop osmosis. I'm so confused right now. Remember Newton's third law of motion? For every action in nature, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Okay, let's say that this car is moving at 70 miles per hour, and this car is moving at 70 miles per hour in the opposite direction. When they collapse, okay, there is no displacement to this direction or to this direction. They are just gonna crash here. Maybe they gonna like do this, okay? just go upwards, but no car is gonna push the other to the other side. It's not gonna happen because they are traveling at the same velocity in two opposite directions. This is the Newton's third law of motion. So it's hard to measure the pressure of osmosis, but it's easy to measure the pressure to stop osmosis. We keep increasing the pressure, increasing the pressure, increasing the pressure until the osmosis stops. This is the osmotic pressure. Now, the osmotic pressure depends on the number of molecules, not the mass, not the size of molecules, the number. Why is that? It's complicated. With metacosis, it's going to be easy. Osmotic pressure depends on the number. Remember, in physics, there is something called momentum. It's equal to mass times volume. So if you have a small car 
M1 is small, but V1 is huge. If you have a semi truck, M2 is huge, V2 is relatively small. So momentum P1 for the car equals P2 for the semi truck. That's what we care about. We care about the number. Both of them are vehicles. So we care about the number. So if glucose is telling you I'm a bigger molecule than sodium, I should be more osmotically active. Tell him to shut up. We only care about numbers. And sodium is all over the place. It's the major, major ion. So if these are two compartments and this is a semi-permeable membrane that's permeable to water but not to the solute. And here in compartment A you have higher concentration of solute. Water is going to flow to the higher concentration of solute. So let's perform a fifth grade experiment. Okay, bring a U-shaped tube and fill it with water, knowing that there is a semi-permeable membrane between the two compartments. Step number two, add a solute to compartment X only. Step three, notice what will happen. Water is going to flow from the area of low concentration of solute to the area of high concentration of solute. So the end result is here. Water in compartment Y is going to move down and compartment X is going to move up. The difference is called the osmotic pressure. Here is what osmosis is all about. You have a semi-permeable membrane and you tell water, let it flow, let it flow, let it flow. If you remember back those archaic days like in ancient history, we used to have something called the periodic table. Oh my goodness, this was so far away behind me. There is sodium and here we have an atomic number and up here we have the mass number or atomic mass. The atomic mass happens to be equal a very teeny, 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 tiny amount of kilogram. But if it's related to kilogram, you know it measures mass, it measures weight. This is the mass of the atom of sodium but atoms are very 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 small and we in the medical field couldn't care less we have lives to save plus atoms do not exist in nature by themselves i can prove it to you when you walk down the street have you ever met an atom the answer is no have you ever met a molecule i don't know about you but i had last day i was going to the library and i met mr oxygen molecule by the way i happen to inhale it but haven't you inhaled an oxygen atom before never because i'm very careful about what i put in my body okay forget about atoms they are too small and let's talk about molecules they are bigger but again they are still too small and we as doctors don't give a hoot we have patients to take care of and as they say houston we have a problem Who's gonna solve Houston's problem? A guy from Italy. Signore Avogadro, his Italian baby. He said, okay doctors, I see your problem. I'm gonna solve it for you. These atoms and molecules are BS. I don't know if they say BS in Italian or no. Anyways, Avogadro said, let's take matter in our own hands. Put it on the table, call it a mole. What is a mole, Signore Avogadro? It's the molecular weight in grams. By the way, a mole of any matter contains 6.022 times 10 power 23 molecules. So a mole of chloride, for example, contains 6 times 10 to the 23rd power molecules of chloride. How about glucose? A mole of glucose contains 6 times 10 power 23 molecules of glucose. We will call this number Avogadro's number. Grazie, signore. So on the table, a mole of glucose and a mole of chloride contain the same number of molecules called Avogadro's number. But there are two differences. They don't have the same weight in grams. Plus, glucose is non-ionizable. Chloride is ionizable. So this was on the table. Now let's turn our attention to in water. Put one mole of glucose in water and you get glucose. Put one mole of Cl2 in water, you get Cl plus Cl, two osmoles. That's why we call them osmoles. Osmosis caused by a mole. Osmosis caused by a mole. If you put all of your professors combined, they don't know this basic fact. Remember also, osmotic pressure depends on the number, not the mass of molecules. The number, the number. If glucose is telling you I'm bigger, we couldn't care less. The moral of the story is, 
Signore Avogadro is a very nice guy. I mean, look at these eyes that are piercing through your soul. So, glucose is telling you, I'm angry. I'm heavier than sodium and heavier than chloride. I should be more osmotically active. We tell him, shut up. We only care about the number, not the mass. Plus, you're not ionizable. You are the lowest of the low. So, osmol, osmosis caused by a mole, provided that the matter is non-ionizable. Millimole, same thing, molecular weight in milligrams. What about a mole, molecular weight in grams? In your body, we only deal with milliosmoles, call this. That's why the normal plasma osmolality is 290 milliosmoles per liter. So let's have some definitions. Osmosis, simple diffusion of water from high concentration of water to low concentration of water across a semi-permeable membrane. Osmotic pressure, the pressure needed to stop osmosis. It's directly proportional to number of particles. The higher the number of particles, the greater the osmotic pressure. Let's say you have lots of sodium, lots of sodium, lots of sodium. What's going to happen to osmosis or osmotic pressure? It's going to go up. Second thing is volume. It's inversely related to volume. The higher the volume, the less the osmotic pressure. Because when you have a higher volume, the sodium is relatively diluted. Got it? Again, a small osmosis caused by a mole. Normal plasma osmolality is 290 milliosmol per liter. Number of particles over the volume. Osmolality is the amount of force per volume measured in milliosmoles per kilogram or millimole per kilogram. What about osmolarity? This is the topic of next video. Now, let's try to answer these questions. Try to measure osmolality in each of them. So, you have one liter of water plus one mole of glucose. Calculate the osmolarity. The answer is, if you have one mole of glucose, it's non-ionizable. You're gonna get one osmol per liter of water. Now, same thing, one liter of water, but now we have one mole of sodium chloride. Is this ionizable? The answer is yes, sodium plus chloride. So the answer here is two osmols per liter. Now pause the video and try to do the rest. One liter of water plus one mole of sodium chloride plus two moles of glucose, okay. Is sodium chloride ionizable? Yes, sodium plus chloride. So we have one mole times two plus two moles of glucose. So we have two times one. The answer is four. You have one liter of water plus five moles of sodium chloride. So five times two. Six moles of glucose. Six times one plus five moles of calcium chloride. Calcium chloride will give you three things, calcium or three ions, chloride, chloride. So five times three, add them together. Five times two is 10, six times one is six, five times three is 15. If you add them all together, you will get 31. Last question, instead of one liter, you have one quarter of a liter of water plus five moles of calcium chloride plus three moles of sodium chloride. 5 times 3 plus 3 times 2 equals 15 plus 6 equals 21. But we have quarter liter and we need per liter. So multiply it by 4 and you get the correct answer, 84. Sorry, this is 4. How to measure osmotic pressure? Are you ready for some physics? Okay, now get the same U-shaped tube. Pot the solute only in X. Water is going to flow from Y to X. And here is the osmotic pressure. Measure it like get your three-year-old cousin with his ruler and measure this height. It's going to be 26 and a, and a quarter centimeters, which you measure using your cousin's ruler, of what? Of water. But now, you know, like physicists are like Dr. Watson. They are super sophisticated and they'll tell you, we have a standardized measuring unit, and it's called millimeter mercury. You have to get this in millimeter mercury. Okay, you put water against mercury, so that this H1, the height of water, equals the same height of water that you got from the first experiment, which was about 26 centimeters of water. 
You put them here and as you know at the same horizontal level P1 which is pressure on the point 1 equals P2 which is pressure on the point 2. Then pressure equals rho GH. Density of water G which is the acceleration for gravity and H is the height of water above P1 equals rho 2 which is the density of mercury. G same G H2 the height of mercury here. Now you see G on both sides you can cancel them together. H2 which is the height in mercury what we would like to know equals H1 times rho 1 over rho 2. H1 is 26.25 the density of water is 1, the density of mercury is 13.6 times that of water. H2 is, if you calculate this, it's going to be 1.93 centimeters of mercury. But we need it in millimeter mercury, which is the easiest thing ever. So it's 19 times 10. So the moral of this story is, if we say that one osmol causes a height of water, by 26 centimeter water, then one osmol causes an osmotic pressure of 19.3 millimeter mercury. So the plasma osmotic pressure equals osmolality times 19.3. 290 times 19.3, you have this around 5500 millimeter mercury. This is the plasma osmotic pressure in millimeter mercury. If you want it in milliosmoles per liter, easy, it's 290. No one ever in history is going to explain it to you like this. I know I'm a very humble person. Who controls your body's osmolality? Hormones such as ADH, nervous systems through your thirst, sensation, fluid and electrolyte blends as base system, yada, yada, yada. Now we're done with physics, let's go to botany. Plant cells have a rigid cell wall that you don't have, so they are very unlikely to swell or shrink but human cells have a flexible plasma membrane the lipid bilayer membrane so in cases of hypotonicity when the plasma osmolality is less than 290 water is going to flow into the cell and the cell will swell in case of hypertonicity when the plasma osmolality is greater than 290 water is going to flow outside of the cell and the cells will shrink so how can cells overcome this force? They have some ion channels. Sometimes they help, but sometimes they get overwhelmed in cases of disease. So let's summarize. Osmosis, simple diffusion of water. Osmotic pressure, pressure needed to stop osmosis. The normal plasma osmotic pressure is around 5,500. Osmol, osmosis caused by a mole. Osmolality, the amount of force per volume measured in milliosmoles per kilogram or milliosmoles per liter in cases of osmolarity which we're going to talk about in the next video. Plasma osmolality, 290 normally, milliosmoles per liter, per volume, per volume, force per volume. This is called measured osmolality. Don't confuse this with, with calculated osmolality, and we will discuss this later. The most significant plasma osmol is sodium. It's the major ACF cation. Water follows sodium, as you know from the previous lecture. So cell swells or cell shrinks. If it happens to be your brain, you get mental status abnormalities and the mnemonic is sodium problems, CNS problems. Okay, my favorite part of the lecture, clinical take home points. Plasma on cotic pressure is a subtype of osmotic pressure, which makes sense. There are forces here. Hydrostatic pressure is trying to force fluid outside of your blood vessel. Oncotic pressure is going to keep your fluid inside the blood vessel. Which one is winning under normal conditions? The answer is oncotic pressure to keep the fluid inside your freaking blood vessels. But when you have a disease, okay, such as edema, this, this is a disruption of the system. But normally, oncotic pressure is winning over the hydrostatic pressure and normally by around 10 millimeters mercury now this is different in the kidney so if this is is the glomerulus the hydrostatic pressure is winning why because we need to filter water through the kidney nephrons so it depends this this oncotic pressure is mainly caused by albumin so hypoalbuminemia no oncotic pressure you end up with fluid flowing out of the blood vessel and accumulating in the interstitial space leading to edema what are the causes of decreased oncotic pressure? They are the causes of hypoalbuminemia. 
What if you are not eating protein such as quash your core disease? Are you going to get edema? Of course. How about you peeing the protein out such as nephrotic syndrome? Or don't forget miniature disease which is nephrotic syndrome of your gut. I've talked about it in a separate video. Make sure to check it out. If you are increasedly pooping protein out such as malabsorption syndrome. Decreased synthesis of albumin such as in liver disease let's say cirrhosis plasma loss in third degree burns you're losing plasma with the plasma proteins mainly albumin you end up with edema transudate such as all of these they produce spitting edema when you press on it and leave your finger it's gonna stay there for a while exudate is gonna produce non-pitting edema lymphedema is a non-pitting edema as well. What are causes of lymphedema? Filariasis, such as Wuchereria bancrofti, radiation, post-radical mastectomy for ladies with breast cancer, infection, and cancer. They block the lymphatics. Hyperosmolality can lead to coma, such as hyperglycemic coma. So, in cases of this handsome doctor, why is he having edema at the end of the day? Because he is always walking in the hospital all day and fluid is gonna accumulate in the dependent part of him which is his legs this is called increased hydrostatic pressure not decreased oncotic pressure big difference why the accumulation of fluid is in his legs not in his head maybe god is testing him no it's called gravity this is that dependent part of him so in this video, we have talked about all of these subjects. You know this old saying, Jack of all trades is a master of none. Maybe mythicosis is an exception. I don't know. Jack of all trades is a master of some. Now, your favorite part of the lecture, quiz time. What do you expect will happen to A and B compartments when the system is left to reach equilibrium? So first, we started at zero level. We added water first, then we added more solute in A than B. This is time zero. When you leave the system to reach equilibrium, which one is going to be? Then, second question, calculate the osmolality of the solution in each case, then write the answer in the adjacent space. This is not a multiple choice question, kiddos, okay? And this is question eight. To get all the previous questions, go to my previous videos in this playlist. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and you can support this channel on Patreon. Check the link in the description for a free art note about this lecture. Thank you so much. Be safe, stay happy and study hard.